Well, good evening. I think we're going to start. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening on our forum on climate change and global warming. Uh, I'm Steve Madison, City Council member, and um, I want to start by um, just giving a quick introduction, and then I'll introduce Mike Ross, who's the uh, CEO of the Pasadena Center Operating Company, who's hosting the meeting along with my office uh, here, and there's a, a connection to climate change, I assure you. And then I'll introduce the rest of the panelists, and we'll have presentations from each of them, and then we'll have a Q&A. In terms of the Q&A, um, Mick Hansen and Audrey O'Kelly are collecting questions, so if you could write them out, and if you know uh, to which speaker or speakers you want to direct your question, please indicate that as well, and then they'll bring them up to me and we'll read the questions and direct them to the appropriate person. You don't have to pick a person to respond, but if you can, that'd be great. So, um, you know, I was asked by some of my colleagues and others why uh, we're convening a, a forum on climate change, and I think, uh, the short answer is because Pasadena is a leader and this is an extremely important issue affecting the community at large and affecting our city. I think unless you're a, a, a lobbyist for Big Petroleum or a senator from Oklahoma perhaps, you have to acknowledge that climate change is real and it's caused by human activity. And we'll hear some of that uh, tonight. And in Pasadena, as I said, we have uh, been a leader with regard to this problem. Obviously, there's a lot of room for improvement and we have many miles to go before we sleep, but we have adopted the United Nations Accords on uh, Green Cities and Climate Change. We've adopted the Green Cities Initiative. Um, we have a plan uh, that relates to state legislation to reduce emissions in our city. Uh, but I think that's just the very beginning. Um, if you look at our city, we operate an energy company. We have the Pasadena Water and Power. So we're not only in the business of, of consuming and using energy and uh, thereby either contributing or to the problem or the solution, but we're also in the business of selling energy. And of course, we have benchmarks at the Water and Power that we're trying to meet in terms of improving the green, the nature of green energy that we have to rely less and less on coal burning plants and the like. Um, so we're not just on the consumption side of the ledger, we're also on the side of, of uh, producing energy and, and selling it. So we have an obligation there. We also, as we're gonna hear uh, when Dr. Walsh arrives, we're one of only three cities in the state of California, and I'm personally very proud of this, that has a city public health department. Most cities lay that off on the county, and pretty much every county in California, all the 58 counties have public health departments, but Pasadena is one of only three cities in the entire state out of, I don't know, 400 cities or so that has a city department of public health. So there too, and we'll hear some, some discussion tonight about the health implications of climate change and pollution. Uh, we have an obligation to be a leader. If we're going to have a public health department, we need to be addressing all the threats to our, our health and that of our, our children. I also think that it would be ironic indeed if Pasadena weren't a leader in the regard, with regard to climate change because some of the best minds in the world uh, are here in our midst and are working on this problem. And actually some of them are sitting to my left uh, tonight. But with Caltech and JPL, and the Carnegie Observatories, we have some of the, the greatest minds in the world, literally, uh, working on research and, and uh, the solutions to, to problems around uh, climate change. So I think we, we, it would be a terrible waste of, of those resources if we weren't thinking and talking and, and leading uh, on the issue. I, I tell an anecdote about uh, a professor at Caltech whom I know, and I was in his office one day, and I asked him what we could do uh, at the city to help with climate change and global warming. And it, he looked at me and he said, uh, do everything you can to improve the Pasadena public schools. And I was a little taken aback. You know, I was trying to think in my mind, are there smokestacks over at the school district or something? And he could see that I was puzzled and he said, if you can improve the public schools, then I can recruit the best young academic and research minds in the world to come to Caltech and will solve global warming. So I thought it was an interest, interesting crosswalking and he went on to explain that 
uh, they lose at Caltech a lot of uh, great young academics who can go to other universities. He mentioned the University of Iowa, for example, where their kids, uh, in their view, can get a better public education. So all of these issues interrelate with one another. So as part of the uh, Green City uh, Initiative and the UN Accords, one of the things that we did is we adopted uh, regulations, if you will, so that new major projects uh, in the city should be what are called LEED certified. And I'm very proud that this facility that we uh, are find ourselves in this evening is one of only three convention centers in the country to receive the top rating, at least I think it's the top, the gold uh, LEED certification uh, with regard to being uh, a green, energy-friendly, pollution-free, uh, or at least minimal uh, facility. City Hall, by the way, when we did that project, the renovation of City Hall, it also was awarded a LEED Gold certification. So I'm very, very proud of that. So I wanted to introduce Mike Ross, who does a great job here as the CEO of the operating company, which operates the Convention Center, the Convention and Visitor Bureau, and the Civic Auditorium. And Mike, maybe you could just come up and tell us a little bit about your facility. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Councilmember Madison, um, we're happy that you're all here. Uh, you are sitting in one of the few LEED Gold Certified Convention Centers. And just a couple of uh, statistics, um, without boring you, but overall the expansion of the Convention Center has proven to be 32% better than the California Energy Efficiency Standards. 85% of the construction waste was recycled from the project, and we saved over $400,000 by you reusing and recycling in the original building. <clears throat> Excuse me, 44% of the building materials were, local, uh, were locally manufactured, 15% of the building materials were recycled content, and again, the building has high efficiency lighting, uh, it has a white roof, which reduces our heat load. Um, the building was built with natural lighting in our pre-function space, our offices. When you look outside of this room, you'll see nothing but um, daylight, uh, obviously during the day, but we have big windows. We have an energy efficient central plant. We were fortunate enough through Council Member Madison's uh, leadership to be able to work with Pasadena Water and Power to provide a very high-end, energy-efficient um, HVAC plant. And this plant um, is large enough to run the whole complex, which includes not only this building, the Civic Auditorium, and the Conference Building. We had a very innovative natural storm water filtration uh, system put in. Um, the facility uses about 50% of the normal water that would be used for a campus this size, and it's done through um, landscape, it's done through water retention and filtration, and it's also done through all of our fixtures, um, our low, um, reduced water consumption. We, um, again, it, it's projected that we save about 37% just in our restroom, our kitchen facilities, and all of our reduced water um, uh, all of our reduced water uh, um, projects. Um, we also, um, we have a very aggressive recycling program, and whether that be, you know, the standard people think of, of, uh, of uh, paper, plastic, glass. We also have wet goods, which is all through our kitchen, because again, we'll do almost $5 million in food service. Uh, we also do a tremendous amount of recycling of cardboard, because again, you can imagine with a convention center and the type of events that we have, the amount of cardboard is uh, substantial. And then of course we have uh, all of our other recycling that we look at in terms of, um, again, food waste, paper, uh, glass. Uh, again, we produce uh, a tremendous amount of trash, but we're able to help by um, having a comprehensive uh, recycling program and again it's through our employees. The beauty of this facility is we're one half mile from Gold Line, uh, the rail station. It's been a wonderful addition. Obviously 
goal line came before the new center, yet the idea that people can take the goal line in and walk here has been wonderful. And then we have a number of employee um, uh, van pool, carpool. We have a lot of initiatives for public transportation for our employees. Um, again, we're one of the few LEED Gold certified um, facilities. Uh, we're proud of it. Um, we've worked hard at it. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day we'll be able to continue and evolve, you know, whether it be solar on the roof or whether it be a, a green roof. There's a number of things that we want to continue to look at. Uh, but with the help of the City Council, um, our wonderful staff, hopefully we can continue to be uh, the leader in the convention center business anyway. But again, thanks. Oh, by the way, we have a brochure. Um, somebody might ask, well, why would you have a brochure if you're trying to be sustainable? It was actually, it's actually a requirement that you have a brochure to, to show people what you've done. So we have these brochures. Um, please take a look. It's been a great marketing tool to be able to show people in Pasadena and throughout the, the country that we're trying to recruit here that we are one of the leaders. Again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. I should mention that I sit on the board of the operating company for the center, and just at the last board meeting there was a discussion about how the customers, the clients, the groups that we want to attract to the convention center, to the Civic Auditorium, and then to the hotels in town are asking these questions. So there's sort of a tipping point there in terms of demand by the community at large to be in a sustainable green facility, which is great. So it gives us a competitive advantage as well. So, okay, well let me turn then to this uh, esteemed panel that we have here. These, uh, these people are brainiacs, I'll tell you. So let me, let me kind of do a quick introduction and then we'll start with Michael Gunson. Then we'll have the city uh, uh, department heads uh, speak and then Dr. Aval will speak. Michael Gunson, uh, who's to my immediate left, received uh, bachelor's and uh, PhD degrees from, in chemistry from Bristol University in the UK. But since 1987, he's been working at JPL, uh, working mainly on the chemical composition of the ozone layer, including using uh, instruments that are in uh, space. And uh, when you talk about climate change and global warming, and that's really the, the central issue there is this ozone layer, as we'll hear. He presently has two jobs at JPL. He's the project scientist for the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, which is due to launch next summer and he's the manager of JPL's Global Change and em Energy Program, which uh, seeks to bring JPL's expertise to bear on uh, the needs and applications, including water resource management, global and local food, security, forestry, the whole range of things that are affected by our climate. So Dr. Gunson will start off, then after that we'll have our three department heads, Fred Dock, who as I think most of you know is the director of the Department of Transportation, for the city of Pasadena. Fred, uh, too, is highly educated and experienced. He has a master's of science in civil engineering from UC Berkeley uh, and an undergrad degree from there as well. He is a fellow of the Institute of Trans Transportation Engineers and one of his principal areas of expertise is in uh, transportation planning for urban areas with an emphasis on sustainability. He served on the transportation research research boards, a ABE 30 Big Cities Committee, and the ASTM's Committee on Sustainability. Vince Bertoni uh, is our Director of Planning uh, and Community Development to Fred's uh, left. Previously, he served as the Deputy Planning Director for the City of Los Angeles, and before that, the cities of Beverly Hills, uh, Santa Clarita, and Malibu. Uh, he holds several leaderships in his field as well, including the California chapter of the American Planning Association, where he's been president vice president and uh, head of uh, policy and legislation. He has his undergrad degree from uh, the University of San Diego State in uh, transportation and urban geography, and he's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Dr. Eric Walsh is our head of public health, and welcome Dr. Walsh. I know that he is the busiest man in show business. I, I, even, even I uh, am uh, boggled sometimes at Dr. Walsh's schedule. And uh, as I mentioned before you came in, Dr. Walsh, I'm very proud that we're one of only three cities in, in the state to have our, our own city public health department. Dr. Walsh has a uh, medical degree, a master's degree, a PhD, if I recall, and um, 
he has uh, brought to our public health department a whole new level of energy at a time when resources have been very, very challenging to keep that amenity for our, our great city. And then finally, to his left, Dr. Ed Avel is uh, an environmental health uh, scientist in the uh, Clinic of Prevent Preventive Medicine at USC, the Keck School of Medicine at USC. He did his undergraduate work in math and chemistry at UC San Diego and his graduate work at Caltech, where I believe he, he obtained a master's degree. And uh, he teaches environmental and occupational health uh, courses at both undergrad and graduate school at uh, USC. So he too is an expert on ozone and the effects of pollution and emissions on the health, particularly of our children, and he's gonna talk about that tonight. So enough from me, let's get started with uh, Dr. Gunson, and if you could, uh, sir, define the, the problem for us and what's the current status. Uh, thanks for inviting me um, to do this. Uh, I've got a, a short presentation to try and frame why I think climate change is of so impo such importance to us here in the Southlands and in, in the city of Pasadena. Uh, this beautiful picture of uh, Pasadena, just a reminder of what a, how fortunate we are to live uh, in such a lovely location. Um, I, in one, one set of pictures, I've tried to capture what I think is one of the uh, stories of climate change and addressed a couple of points that many people have asked me over the years in talking about uh, the importance of climate change. In the, in the top left is an image of two gentlemen who uh, laid the foundation for our understanding of the importance of greenhouse gases in affecting uh, our climate on the Earth today. Uh, the first is uh, John Tyndall, an Irish physicist who started much of the fundamental work on the properties of carbon dioxide when he was doing his research at the Royal Society in London in 1859. So, you know, it's kind of mind-boggling that 150 years ago he was asking questions, for example, uh, why is it warmer uh, on evenings with cloud cover and why does it get really frosty on evenings where there's no clouds. And if you know the answer to that question, it's related to a greenhouse gas effect uh, or a greenhouse effect from clouds. But John Tyndall, who was quite famous in his day as uh, an alpine mountaineer and a glaciologist, started the, uh, a, a very eclectic gentleman who started those measurements to look at the properties of the gas in terms of how it absorbed radiant energy or uh, lighter infrared wavelengths. Uh, the fundamental property which makes carbon dioxide such a potent greenhouse gas. About less than 40 years later, the Swedish physicist uh, Svante Arrhenius published a quite famous paper now where he started to expound on the ideas of what uh, the role of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, quite uh, uh, profound observations which um, uh, we're still are obviously true today, but were quite insightful into the potential for carbon dioxide if it was increasing in concentration to warm the atmosphere. And uh, uh, this was more than 100 years ago. And really, uh, he was concerned that if industrial activity continued unabated, that there could be profound consequences. So where are we today? And, and uh, over the past 40 or 50 years, we're one of the first signs of climate change that uh, were thought to, where we thought we'd see direct evidence of the impact was going to be in the Arctic. A lot of the heat that's generated from, climate, uh, from, from the atmosphere in warming at the equator is literally exported or transported by the atmospheric circulation to the poles. And particularly at the, uh, in the Arctic, we see signs of that increased heat loading causing massive changes in, uh, in, in the ice, whether it be sea ice, the great land glaciers over Greenland or, or, on the, uh, or elsewhere. So I've captured here a couple of images I've taken from uh, my, uh, captured by instruments that my colleagues have worked at at JPL. The first in the uh, bottom uh, left-hand corner is a mosaic of sea ice in the Arctic Sea. So you can see in the bottom left is Greenland, and then you can go round the Arctic Ocean to see the Beaufort Gap between Alaska and uh, uh, Siberia and Russia, and come all the way back. 
What is probably not so easy to see, but is present if you squint perhaps a little bit, is the fact that the sea ice is compacted and reduced in size to that region uh, just off the archipelago north of Canada, which is where the uh, uh, sea uh, currents tend to pack the ice. But the sea ice extent, as many of you might are quite aware, is, is diminishing every summer in, in extent. And now there's a free passage through the Northwest Passage from, uh, that allows ships to actually uh, go all the way to Siberia now. Uh, I think it was several German cargo ships made that trip this past summer. And the projections are quite simply that sea ice is going to shrink in extent every summer. It recovers every winter, it refreezes, but now, unlike in the 1950s and be, uh, in, in decades past, there is no old sea ice which resides in the Arctic Sea from year to year. It's almost wholly recreated every winter by refreezing of the ocean, and then it's, it's almost wholly disappears during the summer. Um, on the on the bottom right is a, an image from a, 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 an imaging system in sa a satellite system a colleague at JPL has been involved in, which shows a very large uh, chunk of ice being carved off a glacier in Greenland. And uh, as many of you are aware, one of the other big indicators uh, is that a large amount of the uh, world's land glaciers are losing a lot of their water. And, um, Whilst we in California don't depend on glaciers per se for water, we do depend on a lot of the snowpack in the Sierras, uh, there are many countries around the world which in, uh, fundamentally depend on their fresh water, on large glaciers melting and providing a steady stream of drinkable water. This is, uh, brings me to the little cartoon I've left in the right, which is the cover of the, uh, I think, 2007 report by the International, uh, sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which uh, for some climate skeptics receives a lot of scorn, but is actually a, a real compendium and summary of the research done by the community writ large on our understanding of climate change. And I did a retrospective recently going back through all four reports that had been published to that point, going back now, the fifth report is due on our doorsteps in the coming months. And I looked at what the, the opinions were on the certainty of change, uh, climate change. And I have to say that the answer hasn't changed. And I think even Svante Arrhenius would probably recognize some of the conclusions and agree with them that continued buildup of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide, uh, are, are going to leave an indelible uh, uh, legacy for us in a warmer world, um, and, and it's just, in my view, uh, um, unavoidable at this point. So I, I thought that this is, in some sense, for many of us living in Pasadena, something I, I feel it can't be very personal. It can be, for me, I go to work, I go to JPL, where I have a lot of fun, but it's it can be quite a theoretical issue, you know, an abstract issue to deal with is what is climate change and what does it mean? And because we talk about it in global terms. And uh, one of the challenges I felt was how does this affect us in California? How does it affect me? What is it, you know, what is it going to tell me about where I live for the, for the near future? And uh, I, I've uh, looked at many cities in the world uh, to look at whether it's worth a holiday trip. And they always provide, if you look in Wikipedia, with an assessment of climate, which is this monthly mean temperature, precipitation, min-max temperatures. And you can get an idea of where the nice places are to live. And quite honestly, there's not many better than where we are right now. And even this doesn't really tell a picture of, of what, it, what climate really means. It's not something that's terribly easy to put your arms around. And I, I, I was very fortunate recently that a colleague from um, uh, UCLA, Professor Alex Hall and his team, had done what I thought was an amazing study on looking at uh, the large-scale global projections that have been done for the IPC assessments, which I just mentioned, and trying to do what they call downscaling, bringing them down to the scale that matters, which is the regional scale and the scale for, for, for the Southlands. And then looked at what that, 
that projections could tell us about future temperature changes, changes as well as other changes that could occur in conjunction with uh, uh, um, greenhouse gas, forced by changes in greenhouse gas concentrations. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through the preamble a little bit here to, to, from some material that Alex provided me, and I'm very fortunate. So he, he studied and uh, looked at a domain which expands over the whole Southland. And what he did is that this particular numerical model represented in fine detail the Southlands, but he drove it with the global models that had been run for the last assessment. So they acted as the uh, calibration, as it were, for this small um, region of projection. And this is a temperature map for the recent past. He then provided um, the, 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 the projections that the climate models use are chiefly dependent on the concentration of carbon dioxide as it seemed to develop over the coming decades. And these have a very, uh, uh, they're called reference concentration pathways. And there are several of these, and they're driven by choices that are made about what you think the future socioeconomic uh, pattern of behavior looks like. And this one is called, that we call it, he called it the business as usual, i.e., if we all continue using fossil fuel at the rate we are, and this is a global question, not an isolated question to what we do in Pasadena, then there's a trajectory of buildup of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which, in my humble opinion, for all the assessments, has been the worst case. So business as usual, and we've stuck on this trajectory, quite frankly, is the worst case scenario. And they looked at that one and one other, which is, if I may, um, look, they looked at what would happen if we got into a, um, an aggressive mitigation strategy. What would happen if globally we could wean ourselves off fossil fuels, oil, coal, as quickly as we could? So there's two here. I'm going to talk about two different views. One is business as usual for the future, and one is uh, what they call a mitigation um, policy. So in this particular chart, what Alex represented is, I'm going to put most of them on there, in the bottom left is the range of mean temperatures in the past for the Southland. And you can see the median temperature, even though I should never use Fahrenheit, is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say, and there's a range projected from uh, the, inter the variations from year to year. Then in the next one over is a projection of the range of temperatures, and now it's not the year to year range, but the range from a different set of models that they've done the projections with for an, a, a fairly aggressive business as usual case. And you can see there's a mean rise in temperature and the range which looks to be on the order of about five degrees Fahrenheit, but it's going to be warmer. That's one of the bottom line messages. Uh, what, what his team then went on to do was compare that to what happens if we did globally jump onto an aggressive strategy to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide. And you can see that, unfortunately, in this mid-term region of 2041 to 2060, you'd, we, don't, we don't expect to see much reduction in terms of the change in temperature. It's not a big effect. So this is one of the bigger points about the impact of buildup of uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. The t you know, people talk about we've already bought in to a certain amount of warming no matter what we do now. And, and so we're going to live with a changing world. Whatever our environment is today, it is unlikely to be the same in 20 years from now. It's going to be, on average, warmer. But even this figure is somewhat abstract. It's a mean temperature. And I don't think it brings home the, the impact of what climate change could hold for the region. So what his team did, which I thought was the, uh, very clever, was to look at and ask the question, what's the change in extreme weather? In this case, add up the number of days where the temperature is in excess of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and then do a comparison between what the past record looked like and what the future might hold. So um, here we are in the Southland again. And to give you an idea, these orange bars are the past. And you can see that roughly the height of a bar is about 60 days of, of, of days where the temperature is, is, was measured to be above 95 degrees. So this is what the distribution looks like. And it's not a surprise to any of us. It's much cooler in general by the coast. And of course, as we get further inland, and you can see we're in Pasadena as the uh, kind of big nub setting from the uh, right in the upper corner there. The San Gabriel Valley is perhaps not as bad as the, in, the projection, in, in the past as areas of the San Fernando Valley and further into the interior. So then I'm going to over, what he's overlaid on top of this, his team have looked forward in the business as usual projections about the number of days. So now the, the height of this bar is roughly 100 days. And let's look at what happens in the rest of the Southland. So you can see the closer to the coast we, we, we are, it's likely that we're, we're not going to see um, a significant change in extreme events or extremely hot days. But you can see that the projections suggest that the temperature, uh, the range of excursions of heat in the San Fernando Valley in particular, and I, I can't imagine what this would look like if it was, if it was extended to further into the interior, we're expecting a significant increase in, in the number of hot days, days where the temperature exceeds 95 degrees. So, uh, I, I, and this I think is one of the most robust and probably dependable results, shall I say, from his team study. And I think it's, uh, for us, uh, something to bear in mind. This is, you know, it's not just a, a small mean temperature increase where we probably have to leave the thermostat or the air conditioning on for a little longer, but we are probably going to face longer periods of extremely hot days over an extended period, something that we've perhaps not seen in the past. There are other uh, results in his study, which um, I, I think in discussion with Alex he, and his team, they felt were a little less robust, but they've looked at things like the increase in wildfires, and I couldn't help but use an image of JPL and the station fire from a few years ago. Uh, and there, um, with uh, extremely hot weather drying out the underlying uh, uh, brush, etc., there, there are some expectation that we could face an increase in the number of wildfires. Um, I'm, this has got to be put in context that a number of wildfires are human triggered. So this is not so much a consequence of climate change, it's just we're creating probably a, a base of fuel for wildfires. Um, there are uh, changes in the bottom uh, left here is an image of, from another satellite, JPL satellite instrument, that looks at uh, scenes during a Santorani event where strong winds are blowing from the interior over the mountains, technical term, kadiabatic winds, and they blow very strongly and blow stuff out. It turns out that one of the conclusions that his team came to is that potentially Santorani conditions may occur less frequently. You've got uh, a hotter interior, and it depends on this temperature difference between the interior of California and the inner four states, and the coast region to fuel Santorana conditions. So um, in the top um, right, uh, one thing that really uh, quite a few of us have talked about what we might do to understand snowpack changes. Uh, the, our whole water system hinges on capturing water in snow in the Sierra Nevada, and then capturing the runoff during the spring. Uh, changes in precipitation, albeit as simple of changing precipitation from, rain, uh, from snow to rain, could have a significant impact on how we handle and manage water flow. Uh, it's less clear to me whether, um, I, having looked into this somewhat about water resource management in a state, uh, I, I believe we handle water resources by historical example. Well, in a period where things are really changing, history is no reference point 
for how we should handle f uh, water in the future, how you manage flow through reservoirs and when you should release water. It becomes, you, you throw out the playbook for the uh, Bureau of Rec and the others who operate our reservoirs and they need new information in which they can operate those reservoirs reliably. And lastly is uh, something I hope uh, Dr. Ava will speak about. Uh, increasing temperatures, even if you can curtail uh, tailpipe emissions of uh, smog, uh, temperature is one of the requirements to drive uh, the photochemical reactions which are a precursor to very unhealthy air. So the impact on um, air quality is something else that we should be thinking about. And it's not, uh, well, it wasn't obvious to me that just simply reducing uh, um, emissions in the light of increasing temperatures would automatically give us uh, fresher air. So um, with that, I, I hope um, that was climate change in a nutshell from my perspective. It's <laughs> how to condense uh, three hours of lectures or me getting rambling on into what I hope is only 10 minutes. I've, I've listed here some very helpful resources. I was very impressed with the folks who created seachange.la, enormous number of resources on that, including a uh, report out from uh, Professor Hall's team at UCLA. Um, I, I, I will give, uh, give some props to the city of Pasadena. It is very progressive in its posture on change and taking uh, positive steps to adapt and mitigate. Uh, you can look at the Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Reduction Plan online, as you can for many other cities. Um, the IPCC is about to issue forth its latest report. If you want another uh, telephone directory-sized uh, tabletop decoration, feel free to purchase a copy or just download it in PDF. Uh, the, uh, I'll plug my own work. If you go to climate.nasa.gov, there's some wonderful... Uh, resources on climate change there, on the measurements that uh, NASA's been making. And last, uh, I was very fortunate to go to a screening of a film made by native Greenlanders called Inuk uh, a few weeks ago. And just to reference the ice story again, here are people in, in this, who live on subsidence, and they made this film about the challenges of living in an environment which is changing so rapidly, where they depend on going out on the sea ice to hunt seals, fish, and just for subsidence. And uh, I, I won't give you the punchline, but I thought it was a terrifically powerful film uh, about life on the, uh, on the fringe, I called it. But there are 400,000 people living in the Arctic region who are feeling change uh, very directly. And uh, I'd recommend it to anybody. I've left you a, a lead-in question here, and I'm not going to answer it now. I'm going to uh, turn over the mic to my colleagues for further comments. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gunson. We're going to um, we're going to have questions at the end, but I can't resist if I can just one or two quick questions, and then we'll go to our, our department heads. Um, w humans are pretty resourceful, so if you look back over time, you know the plague or polio or transportation, uh, you know we figure out solutions. Is somebody chasing? you know, sending bacteria up into space that would eat the carbon dioxide and cure the ozone, uh, big solutions like that, is that something we, we can hold out any hope for? Um, it's a really good question, Steve. I, there's a lot of interest in what if we have to do something drastic, and this is the whole field of so-called geoengineering. And uh, there's two sides to this. There's a great deal of hesitancy for all the unintended consequences of trying to proactively mitigate the problem. Uh, whether it be uh, uh, there's ideas of launching uh, aerosol particles up high into the air uh, to kind of act as a blanket or buffer from the solar heat uh, directly. Uh, there's been talk of putting tiny reflectors into orbit, uh, all kinds of solutions, but uh, on the other side, uh, sure, uh, it may create uh, an effect, but many of us are concerned that we aren't smart enough to know all of the effects of some of those um, uh, project, uh, ideas that people have put forth. Uh, another big, big political question is, who do you want to have the hand on the thermostat? Do you want the US? Do you want China? Do you want Russia? Who do you want to have making that decision? 
So um, there are many complex a aspects to what we can do in, in mitigation through geoengineering solutions. And I, I have a, a really deep concern that uh, you may be better off uh, adapting, come what may, than trying to force a return to uh, through engineering a solution. And then the other question, then we'll move on, is just uh, I know a lot of work has been done at Caltech about how much uh, petroleum reserves we actually have, because this relates to, it's kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. As I understand, fossil fuels means over hundreds of millions of years, uh, animal and vegetables uh, fossilized and at some point were converted into what we make uh, petroleum out of. Right. And we've gone through a lot of that and I, I, I know there's uh, Hubbard's Peak and other you, you, yeah. uh, research. Do you have a sense of when we'll run out of fossil fuels? So uh, I, I completely agree with you, Steve. There's uh, quite a body of work on, uh, if, you, if, not many, if anybody uh, doesn't know this, uh, one of the most uh, pivotal uh, publications occurred many years ago from uh, uh, an oil engineer in Texas, uh, uh, King Hubbard. And what he suggested was if you look at production data carefully and track it through time, the production data will show you that you're, you're probably going to peak in product production of uh, fossil fuel. Oil, in this case, was what he was looking at. He project, projected a limit to uh, oil production in the United States uh, but unfortunately, he didn't really know about the reserves in Alaska, so there was a little bit of an, uh, um, a delay in reaching that peak. Uh, I know of um, the, one of the telling examples I've seen is to look at this in terms of coal production, and particularly in the UK, where uh, a great deal of the Industrial Revolution was fueled by coal from the minefields in Nottingham, in the northeast, in, in Yorkshire, and uh, uh, throughout the country in Wales. Uh, if anybody uh, counts, I believe there are only four coal faces still open in the United Kingdom now. They peaked in production in, and there was a little acceleration in production through the first Great War, the World War I, but it peaked in 1913. Mm -hmm. I believe if you look at coal production in the eastern United States, it follows a similar trajectory. Uh, the, the coal production in the west of the Mississippi is on an, up, uh, on an uptick. So I think globally there are plenty of coal reserves for us to really cook ourselves if we choose to burn it. Uh, oil is, is an interesting situation because techniques of extraction have just changed ever so slightly, fracking, uh, so that now there's a, a, they're tr still extracting, I believe, uh, a little more from those fields. So there's been an offsetting peak Although uh, a few years ago, if you were tracking our own domestic production, there seemed to, we seem to have peaked and we're on declining. We were importing more and more oil from abroad. Uh, that's changed ever so slightly, um, well, uh, very profoundly, because we've sh we're making a really fundamental shift using now natural gas. So there's a lot of um, uh, changes occurring, but um, there are proponents out there that say we've got tons of reserves tons, I shouldn't use that pun. Uh, there's plenty of reserves out there, in, in certainly true in coal, but in oil. Uh, it's, it's not clear to me whether oil actually has a 50 or 100 year horizon before we really do start to see difficulties in extracting it in the kinds of volumes that uh, we've been used to. But it, it's on a very near term horizon before it goes out. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, it's hundreds of years, I believe, in terms of the amount of uh, coal in the reserves in China, the United States, and elsewhere around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again. Let me turn now to our, our department heads, uh, Fred Dock and Vince Bertoni and Eric Walsh. And if you could each uh, just spend a few minutes on, uh, and I, I feel like we've, we've maybe created unrealistic expectations that mm -hmm. my city departments are gonna have solutions to these problems that <laughs> we've just outlined. but. I do think it's an area where every little bit counts. And I think we are trying, as you said, to be progressive and, and mitigate uh, as much as we can. So Fred, could you start us off from the transportation perspective? Oh, uh, certainly. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I had a, my glasses on my notes here. Um, 
the transportation department in Pasadena is really charged with planning and operating the city's transportation system. And so uh, much of the uh, efforts that uh, have been put to date, uh, put, uh, at least put in place to date, really focus around uh, efforts to reduce, reduce vehicle miles of travel, or VMT. Um, these are really borne out by uh, the, the, the uh, elements uh, in the general plan, mainly the mobility element. Uh, reinforced, uh, in, in, which, which reinforces the land use element uh, in dealing of uh, essentially being able to get around Pasadena without a car. That's been one of the guiding principles uh, since the 1994 plan uh, was put together uh, and has been carried forward through each of the subsequent uh, general plan updates. Within that framework then, the transportation department has uh, worked uh, to provide an ever uh, larger uh, uh, transit component within the city. Uh, the city's arts uh, bus system or area rapid transit service um, is one of the larger uh, local uh, transit operating companies uh, that's uh, in the area. Uh, we basically move about 1.5 million trips a year via the transit system, uh, meaning that those trips are, are not being driven. Um, it's also about being able to focus much more um, emphasis on active transportation modes, bicycling, pedestrians, uh, walking, um, and in terms of being able to encourage uh, uh, ex the use of bicycling and walking by working hand in glove with the uh, land use plan to be able to increase the accessibility uh, of residents and in, uh, people who work and visit at Pasadena uh, to be able to get to those destinations that are nearby without having to drive. So um, we're also in that same framework working to try to build a framework within which people may be able to drive, but they may drive shorter trips. Uh, again, thinking of it from uh, an absolute reduction in VMT as opposed to um, not just not using cars, it's about using cars for shorter trips where it's, where it's appropriate. Uh, within that framework then, uh, current efforts are focusing on complete streets and being able to continue to bolster uh, the overall transportation system so that it's easier for people to make those choices, to use the non-auto modes, uh, to be able to effectively get to where they need to go. We are also working uh, quite a bit right now with car share and bike share systems. Uh, the city is in the process of implementing uh, both of those uh, on a bike share on a much slower process right now, but the uh, car share is already in Pasadena and is in the process of being expanded. Uh, these are elephant, um, elements of, of the transportation network uh, of the sharing economy that we're seeing coming uh, about these days that allow you to be able to function um, in an area like in a city like Pasadena, particularly in the central district, without a car if you so choose. Um, so that um, you're able to use a car on an infrequent basis, the car share is a way to, to minimize uh, those miles that are being driven on a daily basis so that people are able to use them when they need them. Uh, city also has some uh, ordinance-based activities, one of which is the trip reduction ordinance. Uh, through that, uh, we're focusing on travel demand management at 44 managed buildings within the, the central part of Pasadena. These are uh, commercial buildings uh, and larger residential complexes. Uh, as Mike Ross mentioned, the, trans, the Pasadena Center here has its own version of that plan. They're one of our uh, sites that, that we regulate to, to try to uh, manage, particularly the commute trips uh, of people coming to and from work uh, to make sure that they're raising their average vehicle ridership, uh, using them as transit and other modes, active transportation modes, as much as possible. Uh, within that, then, we also focus a lot on ride share and transit incentives. Uh, working through that, we uh, have supported several um, programs to uh, encourage bicycling use by transit riders that uh, essentially right now we have one program that's providing a subsidy to uh, purchase a mm -hmm. folding bicycle that you can actually take on the transit system. Uh, previous efforts had worked on uh, helping to um, a grant-based program to subsidize um, electric bicycles that were connected to transit use given the fact that we do live on a rather a sloping plane here that makes it difficult to ride one direction. Um, from the standpoint of reducing emissions, uh, the department in our operation of our transit fleet has moved away from diesel, uh, moved towards uh, natural gas, obviously still a fossil fuel, but one with a lower emissions profile uh, than, than the diesel that was being used to power the bus fleet. Uh, we've sort of caught up with what Metro has been doing in the region, which right now LA has the largest natural gas fleet of transit vehicles in the country. Uh, and as such, winds up having the lowest emissions profile for an, uh, a system as large as this one is. Uh, the other component that has been uh, a hallmark in Pasadena is the electric vehicle infrastructure that was originally installed as part of the EV1 uh, era a while back, but has recently been updated to the current uh, charging standards so that there are now 
uh, on the order of 18 to 20 uh, publicly available charging stations for electric vehicles in Pasadena, uh, with another 20 uh, coming out very soon within the next year. So those are generally how the transportation department's programs are addressing or trying to help the city address their climate change goals, uh, but uh, focusing both on uh, the ability to help people travel, help people make better choices about traveling, and then to uh, encourage the use of alternate fuels within the vehicles they do use. Thank you. Vince, you'll, you'll help us with the, uh, from a design perspective, because I think a lot of what Fred is talking about uh, can only work if uh, our sense of design is more of an urban village and instead of the old concentric circles around a, a central urban area that everybody commutes for hours every day, rather uh, the urban village sense that we've tried to inculcate in Pasadena. Right. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll take a little bit of a step back from, from where Fred's talking about. The city planning department, what we deal primarily with is in terms of really the physical environment of the city, um, basically in all the private lands in terms of how things are, are, are built out. And um, so if you think about it, it's, as Fred mentioned, the first part of how we deal with it is, is really how we plan in the long term and really in the, the broadest sense of things in terms of how do we move around a city? So where do we, what kind of buildings and uses do we put where? And as Fred had alluded to, one of the things that we do, we have to do under state law and what we do in Pasadena is look at our general plan over a very long range. And typically it's about a 20 year cycle that we're looking at. And so some, one of the things that we're doing um, in Pasadena regarding that is to try to design our land uses in terms of how we build and what we build and what uses we put in a manner that you don't have to get in your car nearly as much. Um, you think about it, about greenhouse gas emissions, which is creating a lot of this, the, the problem that we're talking about about half of them are created from vehicles so so the idea of a, what happens is from a car about half of uh, are from a greenhouse gas emissions so we're, we're also now looking kind of prospectively at uses in terms of what we do in the future so um, those are things that we can do in terms of putting a mix of uses in a very small area so people can walk so where, where you may live where you may shop where you may get some of your services all in a very um, short uh, small area where you can walk within maybe a five or 10 minute range, which is usually very easy for most people. Um, putting growth around transit stations, so where we have our train stations along the gold line, as well as where some of our major buses come together in terms of putting putting a lot of growth there. We've also had, had a strategy to looking into some of the more urban core where we already have existing development is where we put, put things the most. Um, we have focused some of our new development in multifamily versus single family because those are more a little bit more efficient in terms of how we use um, land use. Um, we're also looking in terms of our general plan in terms of how we can do a lot of things that, that Fred mentioned about alternative fuel stations and charging stations and things like that. And that's kind of the kind of how do you build a city and, and where, do, where do things go there. I think that um, the next part is looking at the very short terms in terms of, I was talking about how you put uses and where you put them, but how do you actually construct things? You know, what are the construction materials? Do you construct things in a way that is much more efficient from an energy standpoint? Um, for several reasons. One of them is, you know, the more energy we produce in the more traditional ways creates more greenhouse gas emissions and, and so forth. So we also look very much at how do we create in energy efficient buildings. Um, we've adopted, the state of California have green building guidelines and we've actually adopt, adopted standards in Pasadena that go well beyond that in terms of requiring many more buildings um, to have green um, building standards than are otherwise required throughout California. So we very much look at how do we um, construct things and, and those are things such as um, providing for maybe even future systems that we don't that you don't have today, future photovoltaic systems that we require you actually to wire for those. We require p people to wire for um, electrical vehicle um, charging stations, installing cool roofs, which are those are the roofs, which is like a very thin white, I think, membrane where it actually reduces that if you have a flat roof, it reduces it. I did that in my house about six years ago, I think before the codes came about. Um, using gray water systems, and that is in essence recycled water that you can use to, um, for irrigation, and there's, there's water that you can treat that's been used that, that is safe for irrigation purposes. And I think those are the things that, that we really look at. One of the things that I, I think is, I if I could just say things that we haven't done yet, and I had the opportunity to, um, I had a great conversation with Michael several months ago over coffee about that, and, and the thing we haven't really moved into in terms of California is one of the points that he's talked about is, and I think we need to, is how do we deal with that warm weather? 
because you know we're not really quite geared in terms of how we operate on our day to day um, lives to deal with very warm weather. And that's kind of that will be somewhat in terms of how we construct things and where we construct things. I think is going to be something that's going to be very important because that's going to be a very important part of liv livability. And and maybe I'll just kind of wrap it up like that because I when Michael and I talked, I think I talked for like 45 minutes straight. <laughs> well, and I know Vince, when we had our conversations about the UN Accords and the Green City Initiative, even the amount of concrete. You know, if you think about the old surface concrete parking lots. Those are uh, terribly hurtful, I guess, in terms of uh, reflecting heat and, and uh, um, aggravating. Right, and, and planting trees, because pre trees provide the canopy and the importance of trees and parkways everywhere, not just in residential neighborhoods, but in commercial areas, because you can provide um, the cooling effect. You know, you've seen a lot of places now where we actually where they take fields of parking and put the solar panels, which do two things. It provides electricity and also cools an area. I think they've done that at the airport, um, which we've been part of here in Pasadena. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. So is this any of this affecting our health or will it? Well, um, from a public health standpoint, the World Health Organization now estimates that um, by 2000, every year climate change causes the death of about 150,000 people. So. In the public health world, we're watching more and more attention be focused on climate change. So we look at a few things. We look at injuries and fatalities um, because of severe weather, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and other things that are happening. Um, we also look at infectious diseases. And in California, of course, we've watched a battle with West Nile virus. Shocking that there's even some concerns of recent health officer meetings I've gone to around possible dengue fever being in the United States and in California. We've watched other tr diseases, considered tropical diseases, begin to migrate north in the world and actually set up shop. So that's a big concern we, when we look at infectious diseases. We also are concerned climate change may cause increased allergic reactions. So we're looking at um, allergens being moved into places and exposing, being exposed to people who otherwise wouldn't have such exposures. Um, I think we'll have more on air pollution and respiratory diseases, but there's a lot of good data on what's happening with asthma and, and diseases even like COPD because of some of the climate change and impacts on the environment. Um, one of the big things happens to be around nutrition. So one of the big worries is as the climate changes, we're going to have more and more problems around feeding the world um, and making sure that everyone has a food stability, something that we did a good job with for a long while. But as we watch the temperatures increase, water problems happening, we're gonna, we're, there is a big concern about how people get micronutrients um, as the climate continues to change. Um, and then there are some other things. We worry about mental health. Um, because as the climate changes and you have more severe weather, um, and even with just this kind of looming nebulous kind of threat, as was described earlier, of, of, a, of climate change, there are a lot of people who uh, psychologically this can be pretty impactful towards, especially if you live in areas where um, you're seeing this happen more rapidly. Um, so there's a mental health com component. We concern in the future about displacement of populations as this happens. And we've noted there are islands in the Indian Ocean that already are watching massive rises in the water levels. And what are you going to do with all that population if this doesn't stop in the next 50 to 100 years? Um, so we have all those things. So what we do in public health, we look at, um, for one thing, we, we definitely are concerned about water and we're worried about how people are going to get water as these changes continue to happen. I think that's kind of been mentioned earlier. Um, so locally, we look at water. One of the things we say is we want to encourage people to um, actually not have to buy bottled water. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things, one of our, our local nonprofit partners, Day One, um, just got a grant. And one of the things we're going to work with the Water and Power Department to do is to put in special water fountains that aren't like the water fountains of old. These are water fountains that are designed for you to be able to fill refillable water bottles up with um, and promote, obviously, our own water, which is incredibly, uh, the quality of our water is, is very, very good. In fact, even more checked off and then, I probably shouldn't hold this up, um, checked than even um, some of the bottled water companies that we drink. So we want to do that. So water is one of the things locally we can do by getting people to drink the water that we have and not buying bottles and bottles and bottles of water. Um, the second big thing the health department is looking at is urban agriculture. One of the things that will definitely help in this process is if more food is grown and raised locally because the transportation of food 
um, is a major cause of greenhouse, a major cause of greenhouse emissions. So when you look at where asparagus has come, asparagus come from. Peru and what it takes to move it from South America here um, and other fruits. Um, when you look at uh, other food products and the distances they have to travel, the fact that many of those trucks aren't run on natural gas, they're still run on diesel, they're 18 wheelers. Um, this is a major component of what is causing greenhouse gas emissions. So for health reasons, we want people to have access to good healthy foods locally that they can easily get their hands on, preferably walk out their backyard door, back door and go into their backyard and pick. Um, and so that's one of the things that we really are pushing is urban agriculture and things like the John Muir Farm at John Muir High School where locally we we're growing these things and we just had a big food day event at the health department where we had all of these different food products for sale that were grown right here in Pasadena by our own students at the high school. Um, the, the next big thing then is emergency preparedness. Um, and locally, we were working very uh, hard, and we just had a big flu pod last week. 300 people uh, served in about four hours to get vaccinations because we know that we're going to need to be able to respond quickly. We had a windstorm uh, since I've been here that showed that the ability to respond as weird weather events happen is going to be something that's going to be critical. And I'll end by just saying this. Um, this also is an issue of social justice. Because things, when, when things like uh, Katrina happen, it shows you that unfortunately, when you have uh, severe weather, the people who are often going to be most impacted are the people with the least resources. People with resources are going to be able to move, to get away, to move in, to get in a hotel room, hide, build a bunker under their house, what have you. So there's a strong issue when you begin to deal with, with climate change around social justice and empowering the people who are most vulnerable. And locally, that's one of the things that we really want to do through our emergency preparedness program. As one of only three city health departments in the state, that's one thing we can do. And working in every neighborhood in Pasadena to empower people to be able to respond when there's a disaster. Thank you, Eric, and uh, Ed, please uh, fill us in on the work that you're doing. So I do uh, health effects research to understand something about exposure and the effects on, particularly on children in California, to understand their long-term health effects. And so I'm here to talk to you about the environment, uh, air quality, and health. And in the interest of time, so that you can get to as answer some questions, ask some questions that we'll hopefully be able to answer, I'll try and keep my comments short. With respect to air quality, it's not, I don't think it's a surprise to you that this area, Southern California, is in violation of the national ambient air quality and the state air quality standards. We do not meet the definition of clean air because of our continued poor air quality with respect to what most people call smog um, during the summer episodes. And by although the district has been tremendous in terms of cleaning up the air doing uh, in through regulations and so forth and smog checks on your cars, et cetera, um, it'll still be, at best, 10 or 20 years before we hope to get it to current levels uh, to meet the current standards for clean air. How is that going to change with climate change? There's going to be worse air quality here. And so even though we are struggling now to get to what we think, based on the best science, is cleaner air, clean air in terms of protecting the public's health, we're not going to get there. Uh, as the climate continues to change, is going to be more and more difficult. And part of that's because we're going to have higher levels of, of ground level ozone because of the photochemistry, the, the air pollution that's going to take place in the air. And we're going to have, uh, on a climactic scale, on a regional meteorological scale, sort of a, a lowering of that, that uh, pot on the cooking stove, as it were, the lowering of the inversion layer, which means that the pollutant will be a little denser, a little more co uh, concentrated closer to the ground, which will make it a little bit more difficult for you all to breathe. And so there'll be more pollution and closer to the ground uh, in some sense. The heat, the hotter air, the longer, the, the more 95 degree days, as was mentioned earlier, will lead to longer days of air pollution, higher levels of air pollution. And so again, that's all going in the wrong direction in terms of our health. On the health side, we've done a lot of studies looking at the long-term effects in children, and children are particularly sensitive because when they're growing, their organs and their tissue systems are very sensitive to what may be affecting them because that'll affect how those organs grow. We know that this air pollution has a number of effects on their long-term health, and we've looked at respiratory effects, we looked at cardiovascular effects, we looked at learning effects, uh, even issues of neurological development and behavioral effects. All these things, again, are sort of going in the wrong direction in terms of increased air pollution. 
uh, the, the changes that are also underway because climate change involves much more than just temperature change. There's going to be a change in the growing seasons, a change in the migration, because it won't be quite as hot, or it'll be hotter and not quite as cold. There'll be tra uh, a change, a shift, in sort of the growing populations of both the plants and insect populations, which will relate to pollen and therefore to allergies, uh, will relate to insect populations, mosquitoes, and the transmission of vector borne diseases. And so all these things, a longer, a shifting, slight shifting of the seasons, a little bit longer and later arriving uh, um, spring or winter, uh, spring or fall. And so all these things will play in, in generally, uh, potentially uh, questionable ways for our health. And so th this is underway now. It's not something that we're talking about 50 or 100 years from now. It's underway now, and you may have noticed the seasons seem to be shifting a little bit. It's a little warmer now. We're in the midst of it, as I mentioned at the outset, already now. And so what we need to do is sort of become educated, become informed, and become aggressive about starting to take the steps we can do to try to mitigate some of this. Well, pretty sobering, serious stuff. I do have a number of questions, and I've tried to go through them. Some of them were somewhat duplicative or, or were already covered, but let me try to uh, cover as many of these as I can. Um, and I'll try to go in the same order of the speakers where a uh, speaker was indicated. And I think this one would be for you, Dr. Gunson. Um, are there trade-offs between the direct use of fossil fuels versus the generation of electricity? Uh, presumably as a, as a substitute for it. In other words, when we generate electricity for an electric car, for example, that doesn't have a, a non-existent carbon footprint, does it? If I understand the question correctly, are there trade-offs? Um, there certainly are. I think I recall a few years ago seeing the analysis about the, um, the energy required to create a, a a photovoltaic cell, for example. Uh, it's chastising to know that the carbon footprint of creating a photovoltaic cell is not insignificant. So, you know, whatever we do, it's inescapable that our, our, our need for primary energy until the very distant future, in my humble opinion, is going to have a significant fossil fuel footprint. Uh, you, you're going to need primary energy from somewhere to create the alternatives. So um, I, I'm not sure if that's the answer, but uh, that trade-off is, um, it's not obvious when you do the end-to-end -end calculation on where you, how you create something to replace the use of fossil fuels. And uh, it, it's just not that simple. I, I'm not, I don't think we're in an environment where you could go to medieval Europe and everybody have a water mill generating um, spinning a wheel. I just don't know how we're going to get there, quite honestly. And then there's a question here also for you, Dr. Gunson, and it's somewhat technical. It talks about the Berkeley Livermore staff uh, with a model of a minimum increase of 2 degrees centigrade, yet more likely 4 degrees. Uh, but I think the, the heart of the question really is what would have to be done, and I would add, if anything, to achieve uh, less than uh, two degree centigrade rise and the effect on the Arctic ice pack. It sounded almost, not to be fatalistic, but that you believe we're already on a path that we can't deviate from. So, um, as I may comment, um, in the past decade, there are, first off, really profound changes occurring in the Arctic, which uh, just, um, I, I don't know, I'm old enough to remember that you could use the phrase, things moving at glacial speed, to really mean things move slowly. Uh, there's nowhere in the world where you could actually use that phrase any more meaningfully. Uh, things are changing very rapidly, and we've already bought into that change. Uh, the Im future impact of what carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere is not going to run itself out and stabilize for maybe 20 years or maybe a bit longer. Um, if we want to avoid, and it's, it's not credible to me to believe, that uh, the developing world is suddenly going to say, oh yeah, we, we'll stop using coal and, and, and gasoline right now. Uh, no matter what, what, where we are today, I believe that the, the world is going to continue to want 
and use fossil fuels to drive their own economies and raise their own standards of living. So I, I'm, I, I don't want to be fatalistic, but we're, we, I, I think we're better suited to addressing how we, be, how we adapt um, than trying to really mitigate or hope we can stop using uh, and burning fossil fuels. There were a couple of questions, and maybe, uh, Michael, you could start with this, and if others want to chime in, uh, that, um, that I realize maybe we just overlooked, um, but uh, the questions about what are the causes of greenhouse gases pollution, both in Pasadena and globally? What are the principal causes? I, I, I'll give you my, uh, before I hand it back over to the other pa panel members, um, uh, roughly speaking, although the, the numbers are, this isn't quite an accurate apportionment, about a third of the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere comes from use of transport. Uh, there's about a third from primary energy production, I think roughly globally, and I'm stretching for the other sector that's responsible for the final third. Cattle? Uh, hmm. Cattle? Methane gas, presumably. Oh, the, the, yeah. oh, in terms of, in terms of the apportionment of uh, methane uh, as a budget of, uh, then you have to consider livestock, absolutely, and agriculture is a significant source. We don't actually know how to do an apportionment because uh, there's measurements of atmospheric concentrations of methane indicate there's been we have a global change of behaviour. Uh, that could be due to changes in wetlands. There's a couple of papers published recently saying that natural gas, you know, it used to be called marsh gas as well, released in uh, inundated areas, wetland areas, is on the increase as temperatures increase. And there's some papers saying that the release in tropical wetlands is a significant factor. But uh, certainly for, for uh, methane, nitrous oxide, which is the third most important um, human-influenced um, greenhouse gas. That uh, is almost wholly due to uh, agriculture and fertilizer mm -hmm. use. Okay, Fred Dock, let me uh, have a couple of questions for you. One is um, uh, with regard to the free uh, electric vehicle chargers in the city, and are there plans to require drivers to pay for those, uh, for that charging? Uh, even though, as we've heard, it's a positive uh, initiative for, for the city in terms of uh, the environment. Um, at the moment, um, there aren't any plans to uh, institute any charging for them, although we are uh, undergoing uh, a process of uh, tracking the, the amount of energy that's being used uh, and uh, may eventually make a provision in the future uh, should that energy use uh, reach a point where we would need to uh, use pricing as a regulatory mechanism. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, it's still not at a level that um, warrants the, the effort to, to basically put the, uh, the charging in, or the, the, the way to um, a fee-based approach to it at this point. The mechanics of how you would charge individuals for that within the way the system is set up in the city's garages is not, uh, it's not cost effective to, to actually charge a fee for it just yet. Uh, so we're, we're looking at it as a long-term possibility, but in the near term, it still uh, uh, will remain um, a, a non, it won't be priced in the short term. And then uh, another question for you, Fred. Uh, what is the role of um, particular kinds of uh, vehicles in contributing to climate change with pollutants? And, and then another take on that same question is, does the speed of travel relate in your view to emissions. So for example, are trucks traveling at 70 miles an hour more impactful than uh, you know, obviously a Prius traveling at 20 miles an hour or something? Well, in that example, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right on the fringe of something I can actually know something about. Uh, so uh, <laughs> all I know is that the emission profiles of different vehicles at different speeds are uh, highly different, and they have you know, climate mm -hmm. uh, in terms of temperature. Uh, what part of the trip they're in influences them quite a bit. So I I'm not the best person to, to, to answer Dad, that. Ed, do you have some expertise on that? Yeah, in terms of truck emissions, um, it's the, there's a disproportionate impact by the older vehicles on the road. 
So the older vehicles are much more polluting than the newer ones. The, mm -hmm. the very newest trucks are actually fairly clean. The question is whether they'll stay clean, whether that is their, their control devices will actually continue to operate over the 50 or hundreds of thousands of miles that they'll be driven. Mm -hmm. But right now, if we could do something by getting the older vehicles off the road, that would help in a, in a disproportionately positive way. Okay, um, Vince, um, you were talking about trees. I don't know why I was reminded of President Reagan's famous gaffe about trees causing uh, pollution, but uh, that's an aside. Uh, there's a, a question about uh, the tree canopy and why, do, why does Pasadena plant palm trees, uh, which don't generate a whole lot of shade? Um, I'm not sure that besides going down Arroyo, um, in a few places we planted, planted a lot of palm trees recently. I know in the history, um, if you look historically at Pasadena, there's been a lot of historic palm trees. But I think we've had a tradition more recently mm -hmm. uh, planting other things besides palm trees mm -hmm. because of the canopy and, and a lot of reasons. I know that we on South Orange Grove, we have a lot of palm trees. I think the original tree plan there was, uh, I think originally like an oak and a palm tree alternating, right. if I recall. But, right, and, yeah. and, and so we have some areas where you still have them because historically, as, as you know, when um, there's that romantic view of Southern California from the late 1800s mm -hmm. and early 1900s, mm -hmm. um, where there's palm trees from throughout Southern California, they're actually fr pretty much disappearing pretty quickly. Mm. Okay, Dr. Walsh, um, this is a really provocative question. It's, is there a correlation between climate change and violence, in your opinion? And, and I'll just say, the first thing that came to my mind were the hot summers where, you know, the police say there could be unrest, that it's an extended period of heat, especially in low-income areas where air conditioners may not be available, et cetera. Well, in, in um, the country where my parents come from, the island of Jamaica, uh, there are a lot of people who argue that that is very true they, in Kingston. They, 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 a lot of people think that when the summer is worse, the violence in Kingston uh, is a lot worse. There are a lot of reasons why heat would do that. One, it drives people outside, dehydrates people, makes people miserable. A lot of ways that heat could do that. So um, what we, what, one of the public health things that we do look at is we are very concerned in a very, very tangible way that climate change long term is going to increase the number of world conflicts, armed conflict, because things like water, even clean air, are going to come so precious that what we fought over 100 years ago, we may literally be fighting over water and air 100 years from now. So the, the impact on violence long term could be something that we can't even imagine today because of the need for simple things that we take for granted today that could be very different in 100 mm -hmm. or 200 years. You know, another policy issue we could talk about, but not tonight, it would be population control, too, because you look at our growing population. It's nice that we're healthier and have advances in, in medicine and um, childcare and, and all that. It's terrific, but the, the world population is growing mm -hmm. so rapidly. You look at a country like India, which if you assume just rounding down a billion people, and they have net population increase of 5%. So that's net new people, uh, you know, births over deaths, if you will. Uh, that's 50 million people a year. And you think of it, if you take two weeks off for vacation, that means every week you're putting down a community of a million people, a city like the size of San Jose, every week. And what are the needs of those people and all, and it would impact this. There was a question for you, um, Dr. Walsh, about um, the most dangerous, and Ed, this probably goes to your area of expertise too, what are the most dangerous pollutants um, particulates that are extremely small, toxic gases, et cetera. Uh, what's the source of those, and is there an effective mitigation for that? Well, so I'll have to, I guess it depends on the definition of dangerous, but in the context of air pollution and, and respiratory health, certainly we know a lot about ozone as a gas, and ground, particularly ground level ozone, and we know that there's a lot of effects, particularly with uh, uh, cardiovascular mortality for example, as well as respiratory, uh, uh, chronic respiratory problems. Uh, on the particulate side, we, there's been a, a great deal of information that's recently come out, and just last week, actually, the World Health Organization declared that outdoor air pollution is a known carcinogen. Um, and so the, the particulates are, are, are an issue as well, and that, that they're basically small pieces of dirt that are floating in the air of different sizes and composition and from different sources. And again, one of the big sources here in Southern California is vehicles. 
And so doing something about efficiently moving people, transportation, how we generate power and so forth, energy, all that would go towards dealing with some of these issues because the gases that drive the air pollution phenomena, the cycle of air pollution, has to, a lot to do with energy generation and, and moving transportation. So it sounds like kind of a triple threat if you're uh, someone, uh, a senior, for example, with cardiac or respiratory issues. Uh, the heat won't help just in and of itself. It strains the body's ability to, to respirate and the like. Uh, it sounded like Dr. Gunson was describing a situation where the climate change is having a, a, an exacerbating effect even apart from uh, additional, uh, creating additional uh, greenhouse gases and the like. And then um, the, the small particulates and toxic gases are contributing to that as well. So it might so. help with the population control that I was worried about, but it's so not the way we want to do it. So many of these issues are intertwined and interrelated. So that's why I think you have it so valuable here in Pasadena. We have these different department heads talking to each other and working with each other because issues, you know, there's been a, a lot of interest lately, for example, in, in thinking about so-called smart growth, but, but the concern is smart growth in stupid places. And the issue being that, you know, we go and we try to minimize moving around the population by, by putting uh, urban uh, dwelling, uh, you know, apartments and so forth right next to the freeway so they don't have to drive a long ways. And then we overexpose those children and so forth that are growing up nearby busy roadways. So we certainly need to think about these things and place it in a larger context. And I know there have been a number of studies that show the damaging effects of living, growing up within a quarter mile or whatever the distances are, the metrics. Uh, right. And it's, it's pretty hard nowadays in our region to not be in one of those dangerous zones. Um, I, would, I would chime in and just say the, the other worry for the states, of course, is that when you look at us compared to other countries, we do, we do not do as well keeping children out of the hospital with asthma. So we have a primary care dysfunction in that when you look at other countries, they do a very good job of keeping children out of the hospital who have asthma. So as these problems get worse, if our actual healthcare system doesn't do a better job of managing a, a disease like asthma in the office, it's gonna really continue to drive up healthcare costs as well. Hmm. And then Ed, there was another question about, is there current technology, I guess similar to the discussion we had with Dr. Gunson about solutions, is there technology to clean ambient pollution that's in our direct atmosphere as opposed to in the ozone? Well, there's a range of technologies, and most of them are in use. Uh, you know, again, it's been a, I don't think people appreciate, uh, maybe people that have lived in Los Angeles and Southern California for decades have seen the tremendous improvement yeah. in air quality here. And for those people, they certainly appreciate how much worse the air was here and how far it really has come in terms of improvement. That said, current research shows that even at current levels, the air pollution is not uh, legally fit to breathe in a sense and that it violates the national and state standards. And so there are technology in place that are being put into place. We are looking continually for new technologies, improvements, more efficient operations, and all these things again go hand in hand in terms of minimizing the need to be driving everywhere, thinking about how we get there and the mode of transportation, the mode of energy generation to try and minimize exposures for young children for uh, across the life stage, not just young children, uh, all, all people. Ed, you mentioned uh, the department heads talking to one another, and I, I echo that. Um, I will say we got a question, or really a statement, uh, to demonstrate its commitment to sustainability. Why doesn't the city have a sustainability office under the city manager that can oversee all departments? I don't know if the department heads have a take on that. I can, as a policymaker, I can say I can think of two reasons. Uh, right now, one would be just the budgetary woes that we have. The last thing we're looking to do right now is we're downsizing the city's uh, workforce and struggling with uh, rising costs is uh, to create new departments. Uh, I think the other argument, and I'm not endorsing this, I just think it, there is a position that uh, there shouldn't be some separate office that it should be uh, the responsibility of every department head uh, to focus on this. Um, but apparently Santa Monica and other cities have a structure like that. I don't know, do any of you have a, have a take on that? Well, I think that that's a decision, I think, you know, <laughs> you know, a policy decision. But I think that Santa Monica and a lot of cities moved to having the sustainability offices a long time ago when sustainability was something rather new. And I think it's very important when you start something that you have a centralized office to be an advocate. But if you look at where we've come, we've come so far in terms of sustainability that we've woven it into so, every, so many aspects of our city government, the need isn't as strongly to have a separateness to mm -hmm. it like we did some 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think this is beyond a pilot project at this point. You know, this right. needs to be something that we all take ownership of. Uh, quickly, I just want to mention, as someone pointed out, and it's really an uh, apt comment, that uh, the, our water and power does have a number of rebate programs. Uh, I know in the solar arena they've had that. They have shade tree rebates. They have uh, rebates for uh, artificial turf, for example. So I just want to put a plug in for PWP, uh, www.pwpweb.com, or you can just go on the city's website and click uh, toggle to the, to the water and power to look at those uh, programs. And uh, I have a, a pack of questions here on the 710 freeway. And uh, I think I know probably what most of them uh, say, I, you know, I personally, not to hijack the, the meeting tonight, but I, I personally think in the face of this kind of information to be talking about a, a, a fossil fuel based mode of transportation involving a tunnel and trucks um, that was first proposed in 1950 uh, is pretty asinine. Um, but some of the questions here are, um, Mr. Doc, you know, Fred, are we, is the Transportation uh, Commission and Department going to be looking at the 710 Tunnel Environmental Impact Report and uh, weighing in to make sure that these goals that we have to mitigate and reverse climate change are being considered? Yes. Uh, both the Transportation Department uh, and, as far as we know, if uh, Council um, so desires, the Transportation Advisory Commission will also uh, participate uh, in that review. Uh, right now, uh, staff is, is uh, uh, following the, the process of what's being done with the Environmental Impacts Report. It's a joint, actually, EIR, EIS. Um, it's uh, not actually due out uh, probably for another six or eight months, uh, but we're uh, trying to stay in tune with it as we go along. We're also working with our adjacent communities to try to uh, collaborate, to uh, share resources, and to uh, understand if we need to do some parallel studies. That's our last direction from council uh, earlier this year uh, was to try to uh, uh, determine if we needed to do some parallel analyses uh, to be able to supplement whatever Metro is doing as part of their program. And we're still working on that with the adjacent communities of South Pass, Sierra Madre, uh, La Cañada, and Flint Ridge, and uh, Glendale. And you know that I'm optimistic that my colleagues are gonna join me in opposing the tunnel. Um, it certainly wouldn't seem consistent with the uh, the goal of reducing vehicle miles traveled to uh, erect a new freeway in our city. Um, Dr. Walsh, there's a question about the Environmental Advisory Commission and whether the, and I don't know if this is your bailiwick or not, it might be others, uh, whether um, the EAC is going to look at the 710 EIR uh, or not. And, and again, I don't know if that's your well, actually, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I can say that as uh, when the Southern California health officers meet, and that's the director of the health department for the county of L.A., Orange County, Long Beach, San Bernardino, Riverside, Santa, a bunch of us met, and I brought this up after meeting with um, Mrs. Bogart and a few others, um, and pretty unanimously all the health officers kind of thought the same thing. It just didn't make logical public health sense for $8 billion or whatever it's projected to cost to do this, be far wiser to take that money and take a you know an expert like Fred and design other ways to get people around um, mm -hmm. using things like light rail or, or other ways that wouldn't you know burn fossil fossil fuel. So, you know, from an environmental impact and that the county health department along with our health department is we're very interested in looking at all of these things once it all comes out. It's kind of puzzling and disappointing when you travel, for example, to Europe. How far ahead of uh, us yeah. they are in terms of things like bike sharing, uh, mass transit, light rail, um, they just take it as a given that of course you don't need a car. You, you can mm -hmm. fly to Europe, catch a train, catch a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a light rail, use a bike for the day. And uh, so, well, we're probably over our time. Uh, I wanna thank the panel. You all have been terrific to give up your evening. And yeah, it's... And I guess my, my closing hope is that this discuss, discussion will you know, be continued and that it'll be in front of all of us uh, going forward and we'll continue to be vigilant and that, uh, that you brainiacs will come up with some great solutions for us. Thank you. <laughs>